Well, I invite you to take God's Word tonight and open, please, to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4. It's our privilege to continue studying 1 Timothy, and tonight I want us to look in chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, and I want to talk about the danger of falling away, or another way to put it is how to not fall away from the faith. Verse 1 says this, Now the Spirit speaks expressingly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now we all know people who have fallen away from the Christian faith. These are people that at one time made a profession to know Jesus Christ. They may have joined a Bible-believing church, uh, were faithful at a time, and then ultimately seemed to walk away. I know people like that that were a part of church. I know seminary graduates who were active in ministry and in ministry for a time, but they either drifted from the Lord or they deliberately turned away from the faith they once pr- professed. They may have been perhaps entangled in some cult or entangled by worldly values or perhaps fell into some kind of moral problem, but they're no longer living as Christians and they've fallen away. Now, if you think that such a thing could never happen to you, you better take heed lest you fall. We're all vulnerable, and we are all at war with a cunning and deceptive enemy. And we need to understand how not to fall away from the faith. And Paul's going to address this issue here in 1 Timothy chapter 4 in these first five verses. This is not a complete answer. To really get a complete answer regarding this issue, you'd have to study all through the New Testament and get kind of a theology of what the New Testament writers said about this. But nevertheless, the the answer that Paul gives us here is a very good answer, and it's one way to fight against falling away or fight against apostasy. It's a way that we can be on guard. Now, in this passage that we just read, Paul mentions a specific prophecy from the Holy Spirit whereby he says that in the latter times there will be many who will fall away from the faith. Apparently, there were some at the church at Ephesus that had already begun to turn away from the faith, and Paul is warning Timothy about this very issue. So what I want us to do is just study this issue tonight from six different aspects. And here's the first one, if you're taking notes, what I want to call the problem of apostasy. Again, in verse 1, where it says, Some shall depart from the faith. And when he talks about the faith here, he's talking about the, the content of divine revelation. Or we could say the propositional truth of Christianity, what we know is true from the Scripture, the whole body of truth revealed to us in the Scripture. And the sad reality is, is that there will be some who will fall away from that. And we see that all through the Scripture. We can go back into the Old Testament. There are examples of people in the Old Testament that walked away from God. For example, Saul, in the early part of his life, when he was first anointed to be king of of Israel. He seemed to be a man who had a heart for God. Uh, He seemed to want to please the Lord. There's one passage that said that Saul was a man who had, where God had given him another heart. And that, that, that almost sounds like regeneration there. When you read that passage, God gave him another heart. Several times the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul, the Bible says in the Old Testament. But in the end, what we see of Saul is he rejected God's word, he goes to a witch for counsel, and he was determined to do his own will rather than the will of God. So much so that God said, it repenteth me that I have made him king over Israel. He's turned back from following all the commands of God. And the Bible says through Samuel, God said to him that you have rejected the word of the Lord, therefore God has rejected you from being king. He walked away from the faith. In 2 Chronicles, there's Amaziah. The Bible says that he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, yet not with a whole heart. And if you look at his life, there seemed to be this superficial devotion to God, but there was no real in-depth commitment to God. And he ends up bringing in false gods, and he bowed down to them and burned incense to them. And his epitaph reads this in 2 Chronicles 25, 27, that, that he turned away from following the Lord. And then you come to the New Testament, you've got the example of Judas. Was there anyone who had more privilege than Judas to see the incredible miracles that Jesus did, the revelation that, was, that he was able to see through the words and the works of Jesus Christ, and yet he betrayed the Lord, and he turned from all of that, 
And then there's also Demas in the New Testament, the, the man who traveled with Paul for a time. He got to hear Paul preach and teach the gospel, this great apostle, and yet the Bible says that he ended up forsaking Paul. Paul said this in 2 Timothy 4.10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. He loved the world. He fell in love with the world and walked away from the faith. We already saw here in 1 Timothy, Hymenaeus, and Alexander who made shipwreck of their faith. And John warns of people in his community that they went out from us because they were not of us, for had they been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. And so this, has we see through Scripture, church history is also replete with examples of people that had walked away from the faith. Now, the meaning of apostasy we see here in the word depart, uh, which basically is a word that means to remove oneself from their original place. It's a stronger word than we see in 1 Timothy 1, where it talks about having turned aside or made shipwreck of their faith. This word is stronger. It refers to a purposeful, deliberate departure from a former position. And apostasy happens. It happens on three levels. First of all, it happens individually. There are people that turn from the faith they once received. You write down Hebrews chapter 6 where it talks about it's impossible for, for, for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted of the good word of God if they fall away to renew them again unto repentance. Beloved, that's not someone who lost their salvation. That's someone who was never saved to begin with. They may have been recipients of pre-salvation blessings. God was drawing them in the work of salvation, but ultimately they turned away from all of that. It can happen ecclesiastically. It can happen to pastors. It can happen to churches. I read of the illustration of the story of Josh Harris. He was a well-known evangelical pastor. He rose to fame in the late 90s because he wrote a book, I Kissed Dating Goodbye. A lot of youth pastors use that book to talk about dating and, and courtship. And it was a famous book. It kind of launched him into a, a kind of a nationally known uh, ministry. He later became pastor of the mega church in Gaithersburg, Maryland, the Covenant Life Church. And then he wrote a book called Stop Dating the Church, where he talked about commitment to the family of God and commitment to the church. And not long after that, he, he left his wife, and then he left the ministry, and then he turned his back on Christianity. He renounced Christianity altogether. In fact, he, he wrote this. He said that his faith, he said that he had separated from his wife and, quote, had undergone a massive shift in regard to my faith in Jesus. He had absolutely, totally turned his back and has turned his back on the Christian faith. You could say basically he, Christ, he kissed Christianity goodbye. Some of the greatest churches in our country have turned from the Word of God. This can happen on an institutional level in the church. It happens to colleges. Did you know 88 of the first 100 colleges founded in America were founded to organize and train ministers for the propagation of the gospel? A lot of the Ivy League schools that we know of today were, were started on that one foundation of the gospel. In fact, the first president of Princeton said, cursed be all learning that is contrary to the cross of Christ. That's not what they would say now. In fact, you go to a lot of those schools, they have renounced Christianity at, uh, completely, and you can't even really mention or teach about Jesus in some of those places. It can happen individually. It can happen ecclesiastically. It can happen denominationally, where whole denominations have apostatized from the faith. Did you know it's hard today to find professors that believe in the Genesis account of creation? Did you know that? It's hard to find people that just simply believe Genesis 1 through 11 and, and interpret it literally and interpret the day as, in, in the Bible as a 24-hour day. You know, they say, well, the day, it could have been a long period of time. You know, the day, the word yom, anytime the word yom is uh, modified by a number, it's always referring to 24 hours in the Scripture, by the way. And how much clearer does God have to get? There was evening, there was morning, day one. 
and yet there are people that don't hold to a literal view of Genesis. And friend, if you don't believe the beginning, why would you believe the middle and the end? If you don't hold to the literal view of Genesis in the beginning, that has a, a domino effect in all of your theology. It affects all of it. And the church needs to wake up. There's the problem of apostasy, but also the predictability of apostasy. Notice he says again in verse 1, now the Spirit speaks expressly. You know, it breaks our heart when we see someone fall away from the faith, but it should not surprise us because of these words here where it says that the Spirit speaks expressly or clearly is the idea in the word there, or specifically. I think that what Paul could have been referring to here is the revelation from Jesus. During his earthly ministry, Jesus said that there will be false Christs. There will be people that depart from the faith. Take a moment and, and look in Mark chapter 4, just a reminder of what Jesus taught. In this simple parable, he alluded to those that depart from the faith. Remember Mark chapter 4, Jesus is teaching by the seaside. Uh, we heard of the Sermon on the Mount. This is the sermon by the seaside. And he taught them, the Bible says in verse 2, many things by parables. And this is the parable of the sower. Verse 3, hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. It came to pass as he sowed, some fell on the wayside by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty and some sixty and some a hundredfold, and he said unto them, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Now remember, Jesus is giving this parable as a means of encouragement to the disciples because Jesus had been teaching for a long time, and it seemed like a lot of people had rejected what Christ said or they were walking away from the gospel. There was a relatively few that were being committed to what Christ was saying. And the whole point of this parable is there's nothing wrong with the sower, that's Jesus, uh, it wasn't that he was not a very good preacher. I think he was a pretty good preacher, if you ask me. It wasn't the, the problem wasn't the seed. The seed represents the Word of God. The problem was the soil. And the wayside soil here that Jesus refers to in this parable, look in verse number 15 because Jesus applies it. Well, actually, verse 14, the sower soweth the Word. So the seed is the Word. Verse 15, and these are they by the wayside when the word is, where the Word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are likewise, these are likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receiveth it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure for a time. And afterwards, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And so just remember that there's different hearers that are there which are represented by the soil. Some are like the, the wayside where the, the seed is sown on a hard heart and the seed never gets down into the soil of the heart and the birds of the air represented by Satan snatches away the word of God. You know, that's what Satan does. The word when it's preached, he's waiting to snatch it away out of people's hearts quickly. But the stony ground are those that look like they receive the word of God. This is soil in Palestine that was... It had a thin layer of soil, and underneath there was a hard rock, hard limestone underneath a thin layer of soil. And when the seed first is sown on that soil, it kind of germinates, and it, it springs up quickly, but because there is no real root, and it doesn't really get down deep into the soil, that when the sun comes out, it just withers and it just goes away. It's gone. And this, Jesus said, these are those who look like they receive the Word of God, and it looks like everything is good on the surface. There seems to be growth. There seems to be a response. But by and by, something happens, and they are some way offended, and they end up turning away, in verse 17 again, and having no root in themselves, and so endure. But for a time, afterward, affliction or persecution rides for the Word's sake. Immediately they are offended, and they're gone. 
uh, they looked like they were saved. But the word of God did not penetrate deep into the heart. And one little thing caused them to be offended, and they were gone. I've had people come to church and say, oh, man, I've been looking for this. Wow, the word is great, you know. Someone says something cross to them, and they're like, I'm out of here. What kind of, what kind of believer is that? Well, not a believer at all. It's going to take more than that to cause a true believer to walk away from the gospel and the word of God. And that's the whole point that Jesus is making here, that this receiving was not so as to be saved. Look at verse 16 where it says, immediately receiveth it with gladness. Here's someone that looks like they're receiving the word with gladness. But the word receive here, decomai, has kind of a superficial kind of receiving. Look at verse number 20. We see a word receive again. And these are they which are sown on good ground, which hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100. That's a true believer right there. This is someone who hears the word and they receive it. It's not a superficial reception, but they receive it down deep into their heart. And the proof is they bear fruit. The word for receive there is not the same one. I should say it's not exactly the same. The word for receive in verse 16, decomai, the word for receiving in verse number 20 is para decomai. That, that prefix at the beginning of it intensifies that word. They really received it deeply into their heart, and the proof is they persevere, they continue on, and they bear fruit. So Jesus said that even in this parable. There's going to be people that look like they receive the word, and man, it's all great, and it all looks good on the surface, but it's, it's not really true salvation because they wither away. They go away. Paul speaks of those who did not receive the truth so as to be saved, 2 Thessalonians 2.10. And Peter and Jude warn of mockers who in the end time will depart from the faith. It looks like they were part of the faith, but then ultimately they, they walk away and they depart from the faith. And so this is predictable. The Bible says that this is something that, was, that the Spirit speaks of. But then let me give you the third thing, the problem and the predictability of apostasy. But then number three, write down the period, the period of apostasy. Again, in 1 Timothy 4, where it says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times... Some shall depart from the faith in the latter times. And Paul clearly speaks of the time period when the Spirit is revealing this specific apostasy, and he says it's the latter times, and most scholars agree that the latter times were ushered in by the first coming of Jesus Christ when the Messiah came. It's also called the Messianic Era. That's the beginning of the latter times, when Jesus first came, and it continues on through the early church and into the, uh, the, the church age, all the way up until now, all of this is the latter times. But it began with the, com the first coming of Jesus. And after the coming of Jesus, we see the writers in Scripture referring to these last days now. For example, in 1 Peter 1.20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. John said in 1 John 2, 18, little children, it is the what? It is the last time. And as you have heard, Antichrist shall come. Even now are many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the last time. And so this is the time when there will be this falling away from the faith. But then I want you to give you number four the producers of apostasy. We saw the problem and the predictability and the period, but then the producers. Again, look in verse number one. It says, Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And what we see here is the cause. The false teachers that deceive people and cause them to walk away from the truth are energized by none other than Satan and his demons. They are seducing spirits. This is what Satan specializes at. He is a deceiver. He is a liar. He specializes in seducing people away from the truth. The word Satan is a transliteration of the Hebrew word really for adversary. He is our adversary, and he's working against the purposes of God in your life 
and in mine. John 8, 44 says, Jesus talking to the, the religious leaders who were not saved, he said, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So Satan, who was in the beginning a archangel created by God and a perfect angel created in beauty, created in perfection, and the Bible tells us this in Ezekiel 28, it says, talking about Lucifer, thou sealest up the sum, that is, he was perfect in beauty, and also he was perfect in wisdom. He was, he was God's perfect archangel, this, this created being. And the Bible mentions in Ezekiel 28, you know, the, the, the stones, you know, the 12 stones that were worn by the high priest, which gives me kind of the idea that perhaps he was kind of a priest in heaven where he was to direct worship to God. And it says on him that he walked amidst the stones of fire. What does that mean? Stones are really talking about a wall. Fire is really talking about glory. And I interpret that to mean that because he had such a high exalted position as an angel in heaven, he had the privilege of walking in places where other angels fear to tread. He could go behind that wall of glory into the very presence of God. The Bible says that God dwells in unapproachable light and unapproachable glory. And there's a sense that whenever God reveals himself, he only re reveals a measure of what we can absorb or take but we could never really fully absorb the full presence of God. But there was a sense in which Lucifer could dwell there in God's glory, to dwell in the midst of the stones of fire. And in some way, this caused, it, caused him to be lifted up with pride. He was created in perfection, but then he was corrupted by pride. And this became his downfall. And all the gifts that God gave him originally to be used for God's glory then became gifts that he used to work against God. And this being that was perfect in wisdom now uses that wisdom as a corrupted wisdom to seduce people away from God. And so that's his specialty. He is a seducer. He is a liar. Iniquity was found in him. One of the greatest mysteries of theology was how did sin begin? Well, the Bible just simply states that iniquity was found in him. It doesn't really elaborate on that. God did not create sin. God created a perfect angel, but iniquity one day was found in the heart of Lucifer. And, and that's where it all started. And it all started with his pride. That's why God hates pride. And again, all the gifts that God gave him were corrupted. His wisdom was used for deception. His beauty used to lure people away from God. I think he had a musical ability. The Bible says the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes. Friend, don't think that music is innocent. I think Satan uses music to draw people away from God. There's music that glorifies God and the way that it's done, and there is an ungodly kind of music that the message of is to pull people away from God and to teach falsehood, to teach things that are not true. And that all comes from Satan. And so he is the... He is the one that's behind all of this. He's the one who has, and by the way, when he was cast out of heaven, he didn't leave alone. He took a third part of the angels, and they became his seducing spirits. And they're the ones that teach these doctrine of devils that's referred to there in verse number one. But here's the problem. Look again in verse one. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil. This is how it all begins. When you begin to listen to the lies of the devil, then the devil has you. That's where the battle is. It's in the mind. Here's a person that made a profession of faith in Christ, and they hear the teaching of a person inspired by these seducing spirits, and they begin to pay attention to this person, and they begin to cling to this false teaching. By the way, the, the verb here is a present tense of the, part of, of the participle, showing that apostates can... That, that apostates continually teach, and there are people that continually cling to this demonic teaching. They understand the facts of the gospel, but they're seduced away from it. The word for seducing here, planos, where we get the word, our English word, planet, uh, they, they called these wandering bodies into heaven planets because they seemed to them that they had no system, that they were just wandering away. And that's the idea here behind this word. 
They're being lured away. These spirits lure people away from the truth. But notice their character in verse 2. Speaking lies and hypocrisy have either conscience seared with a hot iron. What do the servants of Satan do? They're, they're hypocrites. They have a seared conscience. These false teachers peddle lies under the pretense of being godly. And again, Jesus spoke of them. He spoke of their hypocrisy in Matthew chapter 7. Remember, he said that, that they are wolves in what? In sheep's clothing. You know, I, you know did you know that shepherds in that day wore uh, sheep's clothing? That was part of the, the garb of a shepherd to wear the wool that they got from their sheep. And so when Jesus says that they're shepherds in uh, they're wolves in sheep's clothing, he's actually saying they pretend to be real shepherds, but they're not, they're wolves. And what did Jesus also say? By their fruit you shall, what, know them. That's how you know them. You look at their, the fruit of their life. But they're hypocrites. They are seared, the Bible says, with a hot iron, the Bible says, and uh, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. The conscience, when it is instructed by the Word of God and yielded to the Holy Spirit, helps us to navigate life, making the right decisions, navigating through moral issues. But when you, you misinform that conscience or when you ignore that conscience, that conscience becomes dysfunctional. It becomes seared, hardened, and you want to avoid that, beloved. That's why Paul says always in the New Testament, don't ignore your conscience. Even though your conscience may be wrong, don't get into the habit of ignoring it. Educate your conscience in the Word of God, and then yield it to the Holy Spirit, and that conscience will guide you in the right path. But here, these false teachers, they have their conscience seared with a hot iron. They have a conscience that is dysfunctional, a conscience that does not work a conscience that calls evil good and good evil, a conscience that calls error truth and truth error. And we see that. So we see the, the producers of apostasy, but then here's number five, the program of apostasy. Now look at verse 3 what Paul says, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now Paul here is referring to a legalism taught by the false teachers at Ephesus. And this was a form of asceticism that denied two great gifts from God, marriage and food. And the whole idea, the whole essence of this is, this is a, this is a false gospel. This is another way of salvation that is not salvation at all. And by the way, there are some groups that still teach that today. But this was probably an early form of Gnosticism. The Gnostics claimed to be Christians in that day, but they adopted a number of wrong doctrines, one of which was that all matter was evil, all spirit was good. And that led to two opposite extremes. There were some Gnostics that said that since all matter is evil, it's all evil anyway, so really you may as well just do whatever your body wants because it's evil anyway, and really there's really no such thing as sin in the sense that the Bible says it's sin. So just do whatever your flesh wants. There was a version of Gnosticism that led to licentiousness, lasciviousness, uh, just doing whatever you want. And then there was a version of Gnosticism that said, well, since all matter is evil, spirit good, then you want to absolutely totally deny the body. You don't want to in any way... Um, yield to the, your baser elements, and to them, uh, things like marriage and the pleasure of marriage and food and all of that, that was something to be basically um, uh, ignored or basically you were to deny yourself these things and in a way of doing it in such a way as to earn your merit, to earn your own way of having salvation. This was just another legalistic approach, another man-made way of salvation. And both of these, either in, in license or in legalism, both are devoid of a personal relationship with the living God. Neither one of these focus on true righteousness, which is the righteousness of Christ. We have no righteousness at all. Neither one of these focus on the righteousness of Christ. And this legalism 
that Paul talks about, it's demonic. It's not from God. The bottom line is it's a false way of salvation. It leads to pride. You ever notice how man always wants to, in some way, contribute to his salvation because it strokes his pride? That's why the way of salvation is hard for some because it's a way of humility. It's a way of being poor in spirit, and no one wants to humble themselves. No one wants to realize how sinful they are before a holy God. There's always something that we think that we can do to contribute to our own sal- salvation. That's why um, false gospels like this are, 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 are gospels that spread. And again, it's still widespread even today. I refer to the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, the common practice of, of, of Roman Catholics on how to get right with God. According to, most, uh, according to the most thorough poll on, on American clergy, over three-quarters of Roman Catholic priests reject the view that our only hope for heaven is through a personal faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Okay, again, let me read that. Over three-quarters of Roman Catholic priests reject the view that our only hope for heaven is through personal faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They hold instead that heaven is a a divine reward to those who earn it by their good life. Again, that's a false gospel, beloved. That's a doctrine of demons. And those priests, however, are in line with the official Catholic dogma set forth by the Council of Trent, which denied the, uh, the teaching of salvation by grace through faith when it came out during the time of the Reformation. And the more recent Vatican II, all, which affirms the doctrines of Trent, the Vatican II teaches that Christ's death was not sufficient for our salvation. It was not sufficient for our salvation. We also must keep the sacraments. We must earn salvation through our suffering and through our good deeds. Vatican II condemns with anathema those who say that indulgences are useless or that the church does not have the power to grant them for the task of winning salvation. So again, to the Catholic Church, salvation is through them. And and they have the power to grant an indulgence, which basically is the authority of the Pope to release a soul from purgatory. And you purchase those with money. Again, that's all a doctrine of demons. Those who follow such teachings fall away from the truth revealed in God's Word. You say, well, why are you saying this to us? You know, we're all Baptists. Well, did you know that not too long ago, relatively speaking, there was a serious issue where there was a document written called Evangelicals and Catholics Together, or ECT. This was back in the late 90s. It was written by 12, or excuse me, 20 well-known evangelical leaders and 20 well-known Catholic leaders, and the purpose of this document was to, to provide a statement that would advance, they said, Christian fellowship, cooperation, and mutual trust between evangelical Protestants and Roman Catholics. In other words, they wanted to join together. They wanted to join hands. Why? Because this document basically declared that the gospel proclaimed by evangelicals and Catholics is the same gospel. It always has been. We've just had a little misunderstanding since the Reformation. Well, we have had a misunderstanding, and it's not a little misunderstanding It is a major misunderstanding, and that's a false gospel that is preached by Catholicism, a false gospel. Now, hear me. I'm not saying that people that are part of the Catholic Church can't get saved. I tell you what, if they do get saved, it'll be the same way that anyone gets saved. It's by putting their full faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying people in the Catholic Church haven't done that. I pray that they have. But if they do do that, they're going to have to turn away from the official dogma of the church itself and embrace Christ and Christ alone. Because the teaching of that church is not what the Bible teaches. And to be a part of a movement that tries to join together conservative, Bible-believing Christians to Catholicism is compromising the gospel. That's why this apostasy is so insidious. That's why it's so dangerous. Who are some of the men who, who headed up this group from the evangelical side? Max Lucado, 
uh, J.I. Packer, Bill Bright, Chuck Colson, all these are guys that felt like we should sign this document uh, to join up with Catholicism, which again, I think is a, an attack to the purity of the gospel. But that's the program of apostasy, simply to change the gospel or to offer another gospel, or even more insidious to say, oh, we have the same gospel. It's just different on just a few little things, but we're basically the same. There is nothing the same about the gospel of Catholicism and the pure gospel that is in the Word of God. There's nothing compatible in that. One is God's way of salvation by grace through faith plus nothing else. Catholicism teaches that salvation is by grace, and faith is necessary but is not sufficient. And what Christ did is not enough. You need to add to that the works of the saints. You have to do all these other things to, to benefit and to, and to satisfy God, it is not the gospel at all. It is a doctrine of demons given by seducing spirits. That's the program of apostasy. But now, let me give you the most important thing, and i got six minutes to give it. This is the last point, the prevention against apostasy. So what does Paul prescribe as one measure against falling away? And what he says here is very simple. There's nothing new here. There's nothing, you know, there's no great insight or, but it's pretty straightforward. Look what he says in verse 3, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats, which God has created to be what? Received with thanksgiving of them which believe and what? Know the truth. There's, there's one key there. And Paul is essentially saying, hold on to the truth and maintain the truth and receive what God has given with a spirit of thanksgiving. And what Paul is encouraging here is, look, remember the word of God. Here you have a group of people that are telling you to abstain from marriage, abstain from food, these things that God gave. But God gave these things to you as a gift. And he gave these things to you, intending you to enjoy these gifts. And so we have to compare any kind of ritual or legalism that someone may teach with what the Word of God says. God did not give marriage and food as a being somehow of your salvation if you learn to abstain from it. Oh, if you just abstain from these things, somehow you're going to satisfy God and you're going to earn your salvation. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. God gave you these things because he wants you to enjoy them. Enjoy it as a gift from God. We talked about this a little bit on Wednesday night when we talked about the part of the prayer. Give us this day our daily bread, where we depend upon God because he's the one who gives us all these things, and we should receive them as a gift from God. Listen to Ecclesiastes 9, 7. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God now accepts thy works. Let thy garments always be white, and let thy head lack no ointment. Here is... The uh, uh, writer of Ecclesiastes is saying, look, you know, sit down with your family, have a meal, eat your bread with joy, let your garments always be white. That is celebrate. It's the idea of celebration and have fun and enjoy one another. Let thy head lack no ointment. That was always given at a special supper. You were anointed with a cologne, you know, kind of as a way of honoring that person, that guest who came. Verse 9, live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life of thy vanity which he hath given thee under the sun, uh, for that is thy portion in this life. That is, all of this is things that God has given. And beloved, we are to receive these things, but make sure you receive this with gratitude in your heart, knowing it's from God. Don't take these gifts and idolize these gifts and put these gifts ahead of God and become obsessed with these gifts. No. You receive it as being from your heavenly Father who loves you, who has given you these things, and he wants you to enjoy these things. And you do it again with thanksgiving. Notice how many times Paul says thanksgiving in this section. Again, in verse 3, God has, uh, has get, uh, created to re be received with thanksgiving. Verse 4, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. If it be received with thanksgiving, 
for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And here's the next thing. Just simply rejoice in the goodness of God. You know, that's, that's Satan's biggest tool to get people away from truth and get people away from the gospel. You know what it is? He wants you to question the goodness of God. That was his original strategy with Eve in the Garden of Eden. Yea, hath God said? Well, he knows that if you eat thereof, your eyes will be open, and you'll be as God's, and you'll know good from evil. What's the, what is he saying? Oh, God is withholding from you. He doesn't want you to have these things. He's holding back. And by Eve believing those lies, Satan had her. And he still does that today. Erwin Lutzer wrote this, When you doubt God's goodness, you hug sins tightly to your bosom, afraid that God will rob you of your crutch. When you start doubting the goodness of God, that is the beginning drift away from truth and away from the gospel and away from what God is doing in your life. Don't ever doubt the goodness of Almighty God. And that's what Paul is saying. Look, receive all of these things because they're gifts from God. That's how you resist temptation. Remember what James said, talking about temptation and how to resist it? He said this, every good and perfect gift Uh, Every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no veritableness, neither shadow of turning. God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. And when you start doubting that, then, friend, Satan will have a heyday in your mind. And that's when he will begin to do his work. God gives only good gifts, every good and perfect gift gift is from above. You know, the word gift here, uh, in other words, James is saying the gifts that God gives us are perfect for us, and even in the manner and the way in which he gives those gifts are so good and gracious. God doesn't just give things to us. He does it in such a loving and gracious way. That, that we're humbled in the way that he even gives the gift. You ever get a gift from a person and the way they gave it was like, you know, maybe you should keep this. They weren't very gracious in the way they gave it. Hey, here, you know, um, that's not a gracious way to give a gift. God gives perfect gifts, and he gives them in such a wonderful and gracious manner. And, he, and that's what James is telling us. And his gifts are constant. Every good and perfect gift is from above and cometh down. That is, President Dickens, they are constantly coming down. God is constantly giving good gifts to us. Constantly. They come from the Father of lights. And that, that expression, Father of lights, really is an expression that is designed to talk about the fact that, you know, he's the creator of all the universe. And he's the one that's giving us, and they come down from him to us. And, you know, a lot of the gifts that God gives us, we don't even realize it. We don't even see it. But he's giving every day. He's still giving. He gives us a good night's sleep. He gives us food to nourish us. He gives us sunlight for our day and make us healthy. He gives us clothes to wear, a roof over our head. He gives us air to breathe and the lungs to breathe it. He gives us people to love, family and friends. He gives us our health. All these things come from God. They're loving gifts. And you know what? Just in case you might think that one day God's going to stop doing all this, he doesn't change. He's not going to stop. James says, with whom there is no changeableness, neither shadow of turning. God's character and nature is unchanging, and you know what? He loves you today with a perfect love, and you know what? Tomorrow he's going to love you with a perfect love, and that love will never change. And he will continue to give you these good gifts. And I love what David said in the psalm, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and then when I die, I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God is constantly the giver of all these good gifts. And that's why when we pray... We pray with thanksgiving. When we receive, look at verse 5, this last verse. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. All these things that God gives us, we should bow our heads 
and sanctify these things with the Word of God, with prayer, thanking God, receiving it with thanksgiving and thanking God. Listen, friend, don't ever be afraid of saying grace, even when you're in public and in a restaurant. You know, don't, don't do the quick, you know, Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Who cares what the world thinks? Man, give God thanks. The, the waitress can wait till you're done praying. Just, just give God thanks. Let that thankfulness just abound in you. And tomorrow when you're together with your family and you're enjoying all of that time together and you see this spread of food that's, that's before you, just remember all of that's from God. That all reflects the goodness of God. And the fact that we have the freedom to enjoy it It's all a gift from Almighty God. You know how apostasy starts? It starts when we begin to believe the lies that God is not good. We have to receive all that he has given us with thanksgiving, realizing it's an expression of his love. Don't put these gifts ahead of God. Recognize them for what they are, and by receiving these gifts, let it cause us to love God all the more and to adore him and to praise him for who he is all the more because they're an expression of that constant love that is unceasing. Amen? Let's bow for prayer together. And Father in heaven, we thank you for your word again and how relevant it is for us. We thank you for this warning of Scripture. And Lord, it grieves my heart to know that there will be some who will walk away from the faith. Lord, we pray that that will not happen, but we know that it will. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to guard our own soul. Satan and his seducing spirits are so insidious, so deceptive. So easily can we lower our guard and be vulnerable to the lies that he gives So, Lord, help us by your grace. And may we never lose sight of your goodness in our life. What a great and awesome God you are. And, Lord, may we hold tightly to the truth and with thankfulness for all of the gifts that you've given us because this in itself is a guard of the danger of drifting away from you. Father, may it be so. And Lord, even now also, we we think of some who may be on that path of drifting away where they believe the lies. Lord, rescue them from the kingdom of darkness. Turn them back, Lord, from seducing spirits. Bring them back, Lord, to the place where they need to be, holding firmly to the truth of the gospel. Father, do that work. And continue to bless these, your people. We pray all this in your wonderful, matchless name. Amen.